All right, so let's uh, let's start. Um, well, welcome, welcome everybody to, to Start from Forum Architecture. My name is Carlos Miguel Carrasco, I'm the associate coordinator here, and uh, I'm very happy to, to see so many people with a chilly and rainy day um, here today. Um, we are um, we are again here with a with a new iteration of uh, the online series that we have at the start from that is called Reading Images. Uh, that is a, a series in which we invite some participants to to look closely and to, to specifically detect certain elements in, in an image. This ha has been given to them in advance and so they can have a presentation about that specific image and hopefully extracting and detecting certain issues that can be relevant for the discussion about the topic that we're gonna be talking today. We have an amazing panel uh, tonight with us. We have uh, the author, uh, Marita Kaminami, uh, the author of the book that is also the excuse why we are here tonight and, and which uh, books we have at the entrance of the gallery. So hopefully you can also check it out afterwards and buy some. And <laughs> we have um, Nanako Memoto with us. We have Jesse Reiser and uh, I thank you very much for, for being here. And I, of course, thank uh, thank Julian Rose, who has been an amazing collaborator, collaborator of the Starfront in the last years and constantly is bringing us uh, amazing topics to be discussed, um, discussed here at the gallery. Today, the topic that we are going to be gravitating around is, um, is um, um, the Nagaki Tower uh, uh, and metabolism. Um, that it's, interestingly enough, it's basically a tower that was, con con the concept that was behind the project was temporariness you know, and, and the idea of um, being an organism that had some additions and some extractions to be done in time and in order to, to keep updated the, the building. You know, the building was understood as an organism that was uh, constantly alive and breathing. You know, actually. And what is interesting about that, that issue is that um, the, the, that, that temporariness was somehow never arriving. You know, that temporariness was the key concept behind the building and, almost behind the, the whole movement was uh, also the main enemy of, of the building. You know? like that temporariness was also predicted, was also expected, but somehow never arrived. And I think that what is interesting for the discussion today is that, um, and that's why always uh, we come back to, to that tower as a, as a, as a reference, you know? because it's always that architecture that is somehow frozen in time, so we, we always come back to that moment, but also it's relevant for the discussion that is happening today you know, and, and can help us to understand what are the issues that we are facing today in our future um, and how cities are understanding transitoriness, temporariness um, in, um, in, in our cities today. So hopefully all these issues are going to be discussed today by the images of, uh, of the book and I'm just going to stop here, I'm going to pass the mic to, to the participants and to Julian that he's going to have. Uh, brief introduction. So please join me in helping, uh, like welcoming all the participants. Thank you. All right, thank you, Carlos. Uh, thanks to Storefront for having us. So just quickly, I'll give the official bios for all our participants. Um, Noritaka Minami is an artist based in Chicago. As Carlos said, also the author of the book, kind of the reason we're all here. Um, he received his MFA from UC Irvine and has taught photography at many schools, uh, including Harvard, and is currently an, an assistant professor of photography at Loyola in Chicago. Jesse Reiser and Nanako Umoto, who many of you probably know, founders of Reiser Umoto Architects, um, internationally recognized too many projects to mention, but I think something that's important, uh, specifically in the context of this discussion tonight, is they really worked at all scales, from furniture to urban design, landscape infrastructure, um, including a, one of several important projects currently under construction, uh, the, to the Taipei Music Center. Um, and I am Julian Rose, the a senior editor at Art Forum, where I focus on architecture and architecture in relation to art, which is sort of one of the ways I fit in. So um, to begin with, I just wanted to, to frame the discussion a little bit uh, and outline some of the topics we're gonna speak about tonight. When I was first talking to Carlos and Eva about organizing the event, it occurred to me that a reading image series was sort of the perfect format to talk about 1972 because, as Carlos said, it's a book that documents uh, uh, Kisho Kurokawa's capsule tower, and so in that sense, it's a kind of, it, in itself, a set of very powerful images of an architecture that I would argue is already very image-based. Um, we think of metabolism in a lot of ways, I think, as sort of the first true mass media architecture movement. So. There's something sort of very nice about looking at this kind of layering of images. And 
Yeah, on that note, I think tonight is an interesting opportunity to kind of reflect broadly on the legacy of metabolism, but also sort of get into two very specific points of significance. I think the first one is that metabolism, and especially architecture as we see it in these photographs, um, is really an amazing example of architecture's ability to layer multiple meanings into a single image or a single building and really in some ways hold meanings that contradict each other in suspension. I think one very quick example of that is looking at these photos now, metabolism is sort of a symbol of the future and simultaneously a symbol of the past or of a future that never arrived, for example. Um, and then related to that, I'd also like to talk with this panel about sort of different ways of seeing architecture, different perspectives we have. I think one of the reasons architecture can accrue so many different meanings is that it's very easy for people to see it differently. And so here we have architects, an artist, and a critic or historian. And I'm interested in pushing on the sort of differences in the way we see it and maybe what we can learn from each other. And again, quick example, for me, it was actually very shocking and kind of a, an exciting way when I first saw these photographs because the images of the tower as documented by Nori were so different from the metabolism I had learned about in architecture school, right, in the sort of all my history classes. Um, so without further ado, we wanted to begin by giving everyone a chance to see the images themselves. So I've asked Nori to kind of give you a brief outline of how the project evolved, um, and then we'll hear from Jesse and Annika as well. So thank you. Hi. Um, so uh, I just want to begin by thanking Julian Rose for organizing this event and also Jesse and uh, Medical's uh, generosity for taking part. Uh, my project, uh, titled 1972, uh, began in 2010, um, and this is a cover of the book itself. Um, the project started actually as uh, my interest in the history and the historical legacy of the 1970 uh, World Exposition, which is commonly known as Expo 70. And the Expo 70 was a, um, a significant uh, cultural moment, a cultural event in terms of post-war Japan's history. And the Nothing in Capsule Power itself has a very close history to Expo 70 uh, in the sense that the building was a direct part of, of Expo 70. Uh, this is the event in which Kurokawa, as a young architect, uh, had his career breakthrough. So uh, Kenzo Hange was a chief planner of the event, and uh, under his direction, many young architects had the opportunity to finally realize the ideas that they had developed over the last 10 years at this event. And I think I would argue that Kurokawa, more than any other young architect, benefited from his exposure at this event. So these are some of the selections of uh, the pavilions that Kurokawa created specifically for the expo. So he, at the expo, uh, Kuroka uh, actually made three different pavilions. So this is a Toshiba pavilion, and this is a Takara Butelian, which actually incorporates, incorporates uh, stainless steel capsules. And finally, he actually made uh, a capsule house, a uh, suspended beneath a uh, Tanya space frame roof that's at, that was at the center of the event. So uh, through this event, uh, through this media spectacle, Kurokawa gained a lot of um, media attention in the mainstream media. Even before the event, Kurokawa was really interesting because he was already creating this kind of like strategy of how to become a media figure. And through this exposure at Expo 70, he caught the attention of this uh, entrepreneur based in Tokyo named Torizo Watanabe, who was the president of a company called the Nagatani Mansion Company. And, uh, not, and Watanabe decided to contact Kurokawa to see if he was interested in uh, creating a building specifically for his company. Uh, Nagatine was a, a, a real estate firm that kind of developed this idea of uh, making a medium-sized mansion by buying uh, air rights in Tokyo. And they just happened to own a plot of land in the Ginza district. So Watanabe specifically commissioned uh, uh, Kurokawa to make something interesting, something innovative in this part of land on Ginza. And I think Watanabe was also interested in kind of associating this company uh, to this progressive image of capsule architecture. So this is like an early plan. And in 1972, this building was made. Uh, so this, is a, this was a photograph that was shot immediately after the construction of the building. So this is 1972. And 
140 uh, capsules that were pre uh, prefabricated at a factory 200 miles away from Tokyo uh, in Shiga Prefecture were shipped on a truck on the expressway and then attached to uh, two uh, concrete towers that were pre-constructed on the site. And this is a very interesting photograph too because uh, to this day, this archival image is still used in terms of introducing the building. And it's funny how the building is sitting right in front of the expressway as if it's at a strategic position, you know, in terms of a uh, public image, you know, it's for the public to see. And also at this time, it is probably most like, it's definitely the, one of the more taller structures in this immediate area. And here are some early photographs of uh, interiors of the Nakugin capsule tower. Uh, Prokawa specifically designed the building so that uh, it would cater to what he called homo bobins, where he, would, he had in mind this urban nomad, or urban businessman who would constantly be on the move. And this is a early advertisement for the Nakugin capsule tower to a sales pamphlet. Uh, it says, uh, a, a residence that pursues functionality for the 21st century. So this, this uh, advertising basically shows you uh, the specific clientele it's targeting. And at the time, uh, Nakagi, both Nakagi Mansion Company and Kurokawa's were claiming that they were at the dawn of the capsule age. So they were uh, releasing actually proposals for uh, additional capsule uh, projects that were in the plans. So this one example would, would have been a resort of capsules and a hillside. And they were also exploring possibilities of ex uh, exporting uh, capsules to overseas market. And for me, um, as you know, and if anybody has actually gone to Tokyo too, this type of building construction never became popular or became the standard in terms of uh, you know, the idea of urban residence in Japan. And for me, my project is very much about exploring the current state of this building. Um, what I'm interested in is in that, uh, what is, how does this future appear in retrospect, you know, from a contemporary perspective? And I think another fascinating thing about this building is that the whole premise of this building in terms of, the, in terms of its metabolist logic was that all the 140 prefabricated capsules were intended to be interchangeable that Kurokawa explicitly mentioned that they were intended to be replaced every 25 to 30 years as a process of this regeneration. And yet the great irony is that since 1972, not a single capsule has been replaced. So I was kind of fascinated by the, the idea that even though the building was about the idea of movement, it's been in a certain, in a certain sense a complete cease since, since 1972. So how can I use photography to really examine and scrutinize the, this space? So I'm going to show you some selected images from the book itself. Uh, this is a facade of the building as it appeared in the summer of 2010 when I first began the project. Uh, and what's interesting about what you see on the screen right now is that when you, when you go to Tokyo today, uh, you actually can't see the, the capsule tower in this state anymore. Since that point in time, uh, they actually put a protective netting over the facade. So this, pers this view is no longer pers possible. And this is a B1004, which uh, retains well, much of the 1972 interior, the original furnishings. And this is uh, actually a capsule owned by uh, a couple who uses it as a weekend home. Uh, they live about 90 minutes away from the city. So in some ways, it's kind of like a reverse logic, where you know I, I believe that originally it was more intended more as like a weekday home for businessmen, and yet it's been flipped, at least in the case of this capsule. And uh, this is a side cap this is a side view of the same capsule, and you see the original side cabinet is very much still intact. So you see the original, so uh, at least the frame for the original Sony color TV, the clock, the lamp, etc. And in some ways, the design of the side cabinets, I always kind of interpret it as having this kind of association with this idea of futurity and technology. But the great uh, irony in terms of this design is that these side cabinets are actually made out of uh, uh, wood, plywood. So it's actually very much a part of the carpentry, like handmade object, 
even though uh, it has this idea of like something that would have been made by uh, put, uh, fiberglass. And with this capsule, um, as I kind of go through the building, you kind of you kind of get a sense of like the state of each different capsule. Uh, Starting with this capsule, you can kind of see that um, even though the side cabinets are ha are still intact, the original bedding has already been removed. The TV is no longer there, and it's, it's actually being used as extra storage space. And also, the table has been removed as so that it could be used as a clothing rack. So you can, this is like specifically an example in which the cabinet, uh, I mean, the capsule has been modified to suit that individual's need. This is a capsule that uh, is used both as a full-time living space and, a, and as an office space. So it's really fascinating. Um, this person, this particular resident is involved in the tuna trading industry, and he actually really enjoys living here. Uh, this is the facade on the back uh, from the opposite side that faces uh, the highway. Uh, throughout the book, I also intersperse images of the hallway itself. The hallway actually originally was painted in uh, Hawaiian blue and orange paint scheme. Uh, when I go through the circular staircase is that in many cases, the residents, uh, they use the immediate, uh, immediate uh, the front of the door as extra storage space. So it kind of blurs the line division between uh, what's considered a private space and a public space. But I think you know many people kind of utilize that space immediately in front of the door out of necessity. And even though there are variations in terms of the capsule's design, in terms of like say the location of the door, uh, location of the bathroom, the location of the window, um, in a sense all the capsules follow a similar have a similar constant in the sense that it's similar square footage and the shape is the same. So it's really fascinating for me in the sense that with each instance, it becomes that resident's interpretation or attempt in ma maximizing that maximizing that very limited space, meaning uh, 10 square meters or roughly uh, 107 square foot. So this is one instance in terms of full-time resident. Uh, this is another instance. Uh, this is a case in which a resident uh, is uh, having the door half open. And especially if you go in the summer months, you, you actually see this site quite often uh, where the door is, door is half open. That's out of necessity in terms of ventilation. And I also be, believe there's a little bit of psychological effect where by opening, having it half open, it kind of creates this sense of continuity. Uh, but it's kind of funny too because the towel is basically functioning as a current. Uh, this is another example in terms of a, full -time, a capsule that's being used as a full-time residence. And um, things work. this is actually a washing machine. So, so it's kind of fascinating too in the sense that, you know, when you live in this space that is 10 square meters, it really limits like what you decide to bring in terms of your worldly positions. So why does one decide to bring a washing machine? This particular capsule was empty at the time. Uh, a new air conditioner was added to the side. In the book itself, uh, there's two triptychs that are printed as gatefolds, and this particular one was being renovated at the time as a do-it-yourself do it project by the owner. So a new, complete new flooring was added, uh, it's wood, and also stucco was added to the wall. This particular, this is the second triptych in the book, and this particular one was in a rundown state at the time of the photograph. This is an example that really shows like all the modifications uh, that have been done since 1972 in the sense that uh, the original furnishing has been completely removed from this space. Uh, a new air conditioner unit was added to the side. This molding was added to the top. And also a side window was added to improve the ventilation. And the strange thing about the original design of the capsules is that none of the windows actually open to the outside. So the ventilation has always been an issue. Uh, this is a bridge at the back of the building that connects, connects Tower A to Tower B.
And the book ends with this particular image where it shows the building in its current context. Uh, right in front of the building is a shield domain redevelopment zone where a large height, it was basically an urban redevelopment project that started in the late 1990s. And for years, that was an empty plot of land that was uh, all essentially rail, railroad yard. And I'm particularly interested in this image because with the photography, there's this ability to compress multiple layers of architecture or the urban landscape into a single frame. And with this particular image too, it kind of allows you to reflect, uh, reflect off of the archival images that are circulating of the tar as it appeared in 1972, where now it is surrounded in this urban environment. Um, and I think in some ways, it allows you to kind of sense the tension between the, the idea of the future as represented in the capital tower versus um, the, the actual future that arrived in the 21st century in the form of the uh, high rises. All right, well, thank you very much, Noi. I, uh, I already have a lot of questions, but first I, I've asked uh, Jesse and Nanako to also put together a, a brief presentation. Um, as you'll learn in a minute, they have a very deep connection to metabolism thought a lot about it. It's influenced both their own practice and their teaching over the years. So. I'm going to stand sure. on the side. Yeah, you got to go through the whole, it's like this way, because he did the intro presentation. Just look forward, just keep going. This way. Yeah. on and off with the kind of issues of, of, of metabolism. Um, and I guess I wanted just to open with an image which I felt, you know, given you know, looking at the book and, and the readings of it uh, were, were really important to us. The image on the left is the Adam building by Miss van der Rohe. And the reason why I'm showing this um, is because I think that Capsule Tower, I mean, even in its present state, uh, embodies a very kind of similar ambition in that, you know, Mies delivers this kind of prism, this kind of from the future to the 19th century city. And it's, so it's seen as iconic, it's singular, and it points towards the future. And I think, you know, the Capsule Tower, obviously, even in kind of uh, it, it, its original context, uh, you know, has that kind of similar uh, pointing function, this ideological sort of function uh, to kind of push towards the future. I mean, it's interesting in the case of the Mies, of course, that ultimately probably very similar steel and glass boxes are built around it. So it shifts from being kind of singular iconic image, uh, you know, to part of the context and only experts, you know, might appreciate the details, but essentially it's uh, overtaken by the city. Of course, you know, I, as you pointed out, the capsule tower uh, still is not kind of reached that point, probably never will. So it's, you know, I think there's somehow this element of pathos, this you know, kind of sense of it, and kind of pointing towards a possible future that perhaps will never come. But I want to just to quickly go through a series of projects. Our first encounter in a collaboration with Stan Allen for a project uh, in Venice called the Venice Gateway. It's at the Piazzale Roma. And we were really inspired by the kind of trunk area of the Tokyo Bay project by you know, Tange and everything, the kind of formal language. Uh, even before we sort of understood the entire kind of thing as a system. But you know, we were looking at that. And then further along in the, in the mid-90s, there were a series of studios at Columbia University that were funded by Obayashi Corporation, uh, really at the height of the kind of Japanese bubble. And so uh, typically, the studio would invite a Japanese architect to collaborate with one of us. We decided not to invite an architect, but to invite a theorist, Akira Sada, whose uncle, incidentally, you know, was involved you know, deeply with Tange and metabolism. And then a, a whole kind of series of uh, you know, mathematician, 
uh, and theorists and so forth. Uh, and uh, Asada gave an amazing presentation uh, on Tokyo Bay, and we based our studio on it. Um, and kind of jumping ahead uh, at around 1994, uh, I was studying for the architectural licensing exam. And the image on the right uh, was essentially the kind of the basic hierarchy of highways to territory and you know, out in the free space of the West, they would deploy something like this and there would be a correlation between the volume and speed of the highway and as the hierarchy goes down, uh, you know, uh, uh, larger kind of commercial programming and then finally down you know, to the kind of, uh, uh, residential streets you know, through this whole series, series of hierarchies. Um, we found out later that Tange, when he visited uh, and gave a, a, a studio at MIT in the late uh, 50s, was looking at this stuff. He was analyzing this stuff, and that was precisely the kind of hierarchical diagram uh, that they used, you know, doing that kind of proto-metabolist um, project. Um, so uh, the systems for us came later. We kind of uh, assign projects to our students, uh, basically trying to kind of short circuit or refigure the hierarchy. Uh, so as opposed to the old metabolism with kind of relentlessly similar uh, either, you know, superstructure or pods, that there would be a more complex interchange uh, being explored between parts to holes, the ground, and so forth. And so uh, we once again engaged the Tokyo Bay project in this you know, mid 90s studio, uh, but brought the kind of model of the relationship between ground and network and building and how that uh, kind of interaction could possibly go against the old metabolist hierarchy. And the other issue was the question of the irreducible unit in the later studio. And so we were actually looking at another project uh, by Kikutake, the Sky House, where again, similar to the capsule tower, um, you know, of course he built the house for himself, but yet again, it was also, uh, you know, a, an ideological project that, you know, in a sense is a highly overstructured building. One could see this almost as a kind of chunk of highway or, you know, a, a superstructure uh, in its smallest form. So we were kind of pointing to that, rather than going to the, ta to the capsule, uh, look at, you know, both the kind of capsule-like formation, but also network and ground, and, and have each student kind of define what that might be. So, yeah, that, leading that to more of a kind of mat logics and the relationship of networks to surfaces, I'll kind of go quickly. Uh, incorporating infrastructure into ground. Uh, you know, this has been a kind of continuous uh, interest in, in the design studios uh, that we've offered. Uh, this was what Hanako's uh, offered this in Penn uh, in, in, well, a few years ago. So it's, and in our own work, that whole idea of the, uh, of the hierarchy was something that, uh, you know, of roads to ground to, to architecture uh, was something that we deployed you know, uh, in the East River Corridor project. And even now, in the project that's being built in Kaohsiung, um, this notion of multiple grounds, networks, and object buildings, and how they might kind of interact, uh, you know, is something that we actually use in the practice. So you know, it's an object at one scale, but it's also kind of tied into infrastructural networks and grounds at another. And I'll hand this over to Nanako because she actually had direct contact <laughs> at the time. <laughs> oh, you got it. Yeah. Yes, so um, actually, when I was in, uh, so 1970 was a big year for Japanese people. It's not only for designers and architects, but it's for everybody. So people like my grandfather went to Expo 70 from Kyoto to Osaka every day to see the new technologies and something very new. So that it, it was a really exciting moment. 
And then, of course, I was like a junior high school, but I went there a few times. Um, but that was a big thing for us, and especially that Tange created that space frame with the uh, Okamoto Taro sculpture sticking out, and that stayed uh, quite a long time. And this is a Kuroka uh, And then I dug out this uh, book. Um, um, the simultaneously, lots of it's not only Tange or Kuroka, these people. Um, lots of people are uh, experimenting and making a capsule house. And they are, the, before I got into this, uh, everybody who are involved with Expo 70s, not only architects, but also graphic designers and photographers and furniture designers like uh, Shiro Kuramata or you know Iko Tanaka, this is graphic designer, Yoko Tadanori, and all uh, Kuroka, all young architects, including Isotaki. Uh, this the ex Expo 70 was a starting point. They got some kind of you know commission to do something either small or big. But after that, their uh, career took off. Um, so the, I dug out this uh, uh, book because actually at the same time, a lot of companies were ex uh, producing the capsule house. That, that was the experimental time. So these are, these are the uh, capsules. And then I was a uh, sales lady. <laughs> I, as a student, I got the job here and then my job was showing each capital house. So that's what I want you to show, and I was uh, very excited to really to be involved with, as I said, first. <laughs> so that's it? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Well, thanks to all of you, and I think that uh, that direct involvement is, is the mic on. Uh, that direct involvement is, a, is kind of a perfect launching point for the discussion. So. Um, the first question I have for all three of you is um, what you think kind of ultimately about the, the performance of this building as an image. Um, I mean, uh, Nora, you made a fascinating comment to me when we were first discussing the project where you said you were sort of aware but proud of the fact that it was a total failure as architectural photography, that you, know, you took a, a very documentary approach and that um, in a way you felt you were being sort of critical of the building, or or at least sort of showing the building in a certain so with a certain level of reality that wasn't really part of what the architect maybe intended, or wasn't the way architecture typically tries to be seen as an image. And then uh, just quickly as a as a follow up to Jesse and Nanako, I mean, I think um, that was a very sort of poignant pairing, the Mies versus the capsule tower, because there's a way in which. Um, I think for architects now, it's incredibly appealing and almost nostalgic to think of architecture having that level of cultural ambition and relevance. You know that, like, and I know that your grandfather, in fact, was going to the expo, and that there was such a level of excitement about architecture, and so much of that was how well the architecture played out in the media. But then, you know, looking back and realizing that that was a almost a false image or an image that didn't didn't really come to fruition. So, yeah. Uh, um when you look through a lot of documents on historical documents uh, in regards to the Nakagin capsule tower, there's a really iconic set of photographs that were taken by the photographer uh, Tomio Ohashi in 1972, which was done kind of like under the you know the, the genre of you know architectural photography or commercial architectural photography, and, and they're really spectacular images. Um, in terms of my larger interest too, I, I feel like a lot of, say, commercial architectural photography, there's always this kind of ritual or repetition that happens in terms of all the photographs were taken uh, either right before the completion of the building or right after the completion of the building. And I think in some ways that is the result of practicality in the sense that you want to show the building in a very pristine look, a very idealized manner. Um, and in terms of my own photographic practice, uh, I was kind of joking with Julian last night, is that in many ways this is a failure, if, if it is about architectural photography in the sense that it is, it is not about idealized, it, it's, not, it's definitely not about I, uh, idealized representation of the space. Uh, I'm very much interested in, in the sense that 
this passage of time, you know, that kind of classic question of photography in terms of indexicality and how do you represent history? And in some ways, this building has, for me, has become a lot more interesting in the 44 years that has passed since it first opened because in some ways you look at all the different capsules and those, even though they had a very similar starting point in terms of prefabricated units with very similar setups, it's really fascinating and really wondrous uh, in terms of all the different trajectories and lives and experiences that were, that happened in each of the 140 capsules, you know? Or in one space, at one part of the building, you have this capsule in a complete pristine state. And in another capsule, you, in another part of the building, you have this capsule where literally there's plants growing because of the, you know, flooding of the floor. So in some ways, it, it just, it's a really fascinating sense that each container becomes a history in its own right. And it's, it becomes very much about the building and the residents, not so much than say, um, a tr traditional representation in terms of architecture. And I mean, back to you guys both, I guess, this question of traditional versus non-traditional representation, but also then sort of how, how maybe these photographs make you think about that, that archival or historical image of the building. No, I mean, it's, I don't know if I'm answering the question, but um, I guess we always try to look past, you know, I mean, that I guess it's, a, it's also a question of what you see and what you know. Mm -hmm. And so um, for a variety of reasons, we probably, ref uh, I or, well, but I almost refuse to see what happens in the daily life of the building. And we're sort of looking at it, well, you know, kind of hope springs eternal. so. It could have happened, but they got some of the things wrong, right? I mean, like, the kind of demand to change the capsules out was like the hardest thing to do, right? That they would have to have a crane on site, probably, and keep it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, probably I would say I almost have a refusal to kind of look at the kind of pathos, I know there is I, at one level, but in terms of as, as a designer, I said, well, it, it could almost be right, but let's, you know, kind of shift away from the capsule, which is the most difficult thing to change. Obviously, you can change the interior stuff. The market will practically do that, or the inhabitants, which they are doing. Um, and I guess the superstructure is also, you know, kind of really resistant, but. Yeah, I mean, it, it, to kind of look at, to ch change the terms of the relationship, you know, the hierarchy problem, the, the question of, uh, you know, like this rigid superstructure or megastructure that they hope to build, you know, beyond that building and then the pods and keeping them so discreet, uh, you know, was the way we were looking at this. Um, and I think, I mean, I, you know, the hope I would bring to the images, I guess, is almost an Argo-like thing, where, you know, the people are retrofitting and retrofitting and retrofitting. It's actually become more like what the International Space Station <laughs> looks like, right, right. rather than an idealized piece of furniture. I mean, they, the actual capsules have all of that hanging, kind of festooned guts and yeah. strange, you know, stuff. So. Yeah, I guess I look at it in a more hopeful way. I always try to. Um, I don't know what you know, Nanako thinks is a different experience. I don't know. Um, I guess uh, first, um, the most uh, impressive, no, no, how do I say it? Is, uh, most interesting picture he has is a uh, unit which has a mold in there because. Because that's like a, uh, for Japanese, any Japanese house, not a traditional house, because traditional houses designed to uh, circulate the air or constantly, therefore it's very cold all the time. But uh, when you look at this thing, this is like most predictable and it's happened all the time. So this is the 
Japanese uh, construction company or Japanese architects or anybody who had to battle with these conditions. And it, every time I meet my friend, they, they are always getting phone calls and what do you do with these mold issues? And they are talking, <laughs> they are talking about that. <laughs> well, they're air conditioning. And yeah. then they can, you know, things condense, and then it's just yeah. inevitable. Yeah, so that's I overhear from everybody. So um, yeah, this is a battle of Japanese uh, architect, and uh, I guess there is a solution. I heard how to do it, but um, I don't talk about it. <laughs> but I was quite surprised at how big this unit is mm -hmm. for the typical Japanese standard. When you are young, you have a four. Uh, four and a half tatami mat. And then you may have a one tatami mat of uh, storage and a half tatami mat of kitchen. So that's like a, a normal starting young people's living condition. And this one has an eight tatami mat, which is like a like, luxurious. For uh, Tokyo standard, it's like a living room. But Kyoto standard, it's slightly small because Kyoto tatami mat is bigger. <laughs> And then, <laughs> and then I thought about um, where this thing is going, this idea. When yeah, you know yeah. that's, a, that's a good question, right? And then now, I think it went to toilet and shower because every unit, apartment unit you visit, they have uh, you know these uh, pre-made uh, plastic. Uh, bathroom, which is really, works really well for these conditions, especially Japanese, who get mold all the time. So therefore, if you have this unit of bathrooms, you don't get the mold. But in between concrete and plastic, I don't know. I don't want to think about that. <laughs> so that's everywhere. That's really successful. Even a normal house, they use that too. <laughs> I mean, in constructing this building, Kurokawa and Associates pretty much had to come up with everything for the first time. And I, I think this this building did pave the way for a lot of different models in the sense that it kind of, it was, it paved the way in terms of uh, one room mansion in mm -hmm. Tokyo and also the idea of prefabricated toilet units that's pretty much uh, common in Japan today. I think this is one of the early instances in which it was implemented. Uh, but. What's fascinating about this particular photograph too is that if you actually look at it in detail, and you know if you look at the book, you see it in greater clarity. But um, you actually see the fact that a lot of the material that is that the room itself is made is actually wood. That you do see the wooden veneer kind of peeling off, and right beneath that is actually the the problematic aspect of the construction, which is the asbestos, the fireproofing. Uh, but again, uh, the fascinating thing about photography and also in terms of the past, like this idea of time, is that this particular photograph does kind of create an impression in terms of where this particular capsule is headed in terms of, like, say, the tra trajectory of, you know, entropy. But since, since the point in which I actually took this photograph, this capsule has been completely renovated, so now it's uh, habitable again. Main concept, uh, the main uh, decision, the main reason for decision to tear this building was 80% of surface was asbestos. So that was the main reason I hear. And then removing asbestos is more expensive than keeping it. So probably you have to pay seal that they tell you and then it be designed. I wonder too if you know this is sort of passed through some kind of change because of the you know, latter day advertising or kind of discussion like the metabolism show and it, it kind of reaching the status of an art object, whether it becomes like a, a collectible or that the units are you know kind of purchased or refurbished. I mean, it's not what was intended. But it passes into this other, you know, kind of realm now, uh, you know, culturally. I don't know where it is, frankly, but you know, you, you do see, uh, you know, some of those capsules out of the building and then uh, as collectibles. Well, no, I think the project unfolded over four or five years. Did you notice a shift even as you were working? Because I think you started it before 
the big metabolism show at the Mori Museum and before Rome Cool House did his big metabolism talks, both, both of which were 2011. So did you have a sense that there was a kind of shift in the inhabitants or the cultural perception of the building? Yes, um, I think around 2006, 2007, um, th there was a particular resident who was very active in terms of the internet, creating this really wonderful blog on the life of the building. Um, and through his generosity, this project, my particular project, uh, was possible. So I can't thank him enough. Um, and along with the Mori Art Museum um, exhibition that opened in 2011, where it brought put the building back in spotlight and created, you know, led to renewed attention. There's also a, an infusion of new residents who are specifically seriously invested in the idea of how, the question of how to restore the building, how to renovate the building. So, so since that point in time, you do see many examples in which there are like uh, really interesting do-it-yourself projects in terms of how, how can they renovate the capsules on their own. Do they rent or own? Uh, all these capsules are actually technically considered to be condominiums, so they are all owned by different owners, and they, they either be rent, uh, they either have the owner or be rented it out. Do you know what is the average length that someone actually stays there? Well, some people stay there full time. No, I mean like not not every every day. I'm talking about like, do they average stay like do they live there two years? Do they live there ten years? Uh, the person that I know who has been there the longest, I believe he's been there for at least now eight years. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. He uses it uh, as a rental. But, but that's not a very long time. Eight so years. Really like right. Oh, no, since the building first right. opened. Because, I mean, the thing that uh, gets me is when you said that it's a failure in architectural photography. For me, it's like the architecture falls away, and all the elements that are in the rooms remind, makes me think of the people and what kind of people live there, and mm. and how how functional that you can make any box. Mm. I don't think this is a question about architecture in in this way that you've been talking about it so far. It's, I mean. When I mention failure in architectural photography, I, I talk about it more in terms of formalistic sense of architectural photography, the language of mainstream uh, architectural photography. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about the architecture itself, and I, I refuse to believe that this building is a failure. So it withstands, so it's prime real estate, so it withstands all this time in its very expensive neighborhood, so mm -hmm. it's definitely a success. Well, I mean, it, it really depends on how you see it. What, what makes it a success, you know, where I think calling something a failure, I had this discussion with Julian the other night too, it, it's, it's really easy to call something a failure, it's almost like a cliche now, but I think the fact that this building has been so influential as an idea and a concept, where it led to these other kind of innovations that you even see today in terms of small living, that, that in itself is quite significant. And I'm also fascinated by this building in itself, um, that Korkawa had an intent, a specific type of intent for the vision, a program for the building in 1972, and yet the building has kind of taken a new meaning in relation to the current landscape of Tokyo, and for me that's fascinating, in that the, the building takes on a new meaning in relation because the, the situation has changed. And I, I'd love to follow up. Uh on this idea of program and unit. I mean, I think, Danica, your point that in some ways the, the real afterlife of the pod or the capsule is in the toilet, that you know, maybe, that it, maybe it's best in the, sort of the most purely functional dimension of architecture, um, but it, as we sort of see from these images, it, it somehow fails to really anticipate the complexities of living, even this tiny box, you know, that people will inevitably sort of customize it there, for me, some of the most interesting images were the hallway, you know, that everyone, not only do you leave the door open, but you sort of stack your books outside or you move your bike outside. That, in a way, to me, that's a very literal rendition of the fact that, you know, the boundary of inhabitation or the sort of spatial dimensions of one's life can't be directly mapped onto this spatial unit or the structural right. unit, as Kurokawa tried. But, so I'm wondering, as, you know, as architects, what does that teach you? How do you then approach a problem of programming like this? You mentioned, you know, um, your interest in the the capsule house. In you know, that maybe there's something productive as a sort of methodology or design or formal device almost, but that it doesn't need to also 
be totally corresponding with the program. Right. Uh, in, in fact, uh, the interior of Pod was designed by uh, Abe. Um, he was an interior designer, but his hobby was uh, designing of the yacht since he was small. So the, it's totally functional. He yeah. designed this pod as a totally functional uh, space. So therefore, you can see the fragment. You know, everything is fitted like yeah. a boat. Yeah. yeah, that's the interesting part. And originally, this uh, space was designed for second house. It's not the your main house. But I think, yeah, I mean, I think the part of the pathos is, you know, that you just, it's so overdetermined right, right. and kind of speaks to a technology of a certain moment uh, and that, you know, that moment is past the, trend, the you know, transistor radio and the TV of right. that time and or the, 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 the eight track, track yeah. tape machine. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think that is, I guess it becomes problematic at some level. On the other hand, probably there's a kind of subculture that would die to have that, or they would buy it. Yeah. You know, like the Japanese who will, you know, buy the uh, tube sets and the turntable. So, I don't know, it just it kind of shifts into another market, I guess, or group of aficionados who, you know, might desire it because of its dysfunction or it's kind of old function and nostalgia market. Um, yeah, but I mean a, a wider question of yeah uh, how much one should kind of determine these kinds of functions and how much you kind of leave to the inhabitant yeah. or you know that you design something with, without such a tight fit. Right. What I'm, I'm wondering too is almost as a design tool, the unit in metabolism enabled a certain level of flexibility, right? It was all it's sort of, but it's kind of always in this pixelated way where you can input a hierarchy, you can have a variation in a pattern. But for you, especially with the way you're using a lot of digital design tools, is that just sort of totally irrelevant now? I mean, is, is there still a, a utility to having a kind of basic unit of space, or with say? I yes. think so. Okay. I mean, but I don't know if that's actually. I mean, then one would also potentially say, well, I'll kind of describe that unit of space, but maybe it isn't. It's not for us to um, go down to the scale of the furniture and overdetermine it that way. It's more like, you know, it's what Aldo Rossi used to say. I, mean, like, I guess every architect has their sort of scalar right. limit. You know, that you that, that's not my business. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I guess scaling it to be open enough to change also is a question more like literally the scale of those pods. Yeah, yeah. Um, although Nanako says they're, you know, they're, they're, generous. they're actually yeah. generous. But, I mean, that would be the other question, whether <laughs> these interiors would be kind of generated by, the, by those spaces or whether that's pretty typical of you know, many d desks and dwellings sure. in Tokyo. I mean, how ubiquitous is that kind of, um, you know, development in interiors? Is it peculiar to this project or not? And Nora, I'm curious for you, as sort of your thoughts on the unit, because, I mean, on the one hand, it your project kind of demonstrates its limitations, but on the other hand, it's obviously an incredibly useful tool for organizing the project itself. And I think one thing we talked about is you're sort of once removed a student of the Beshers, for example. <laughs> so that, you know, there's a certain, I think, affinity between architectural typologies and photographic approaches. I mean, do you have thoughts on the unit almost as a methodology for yourself, uh, you know, as a photographer, but almost borrowed from architecture? Yeah, um, I was talking to Julian uh, about how the project initially kind of started with this impulse of creating a typology where um, very much you have right in front of you this idea of seriality, the repetition of similar units. And in, in the sense, uh, 
in the photographic sense too, you know, there's this kind of desire in terms of like how to create, at least for me, how to create very uniform, consistent photographs over and over and over again in terms of like in terms of like for formal elements, you know, in terms of like say distance, placement, lighting condition, etc., where you can kind of create almost like a scientific deadpan approach to studying these spaces. And that was kind of like uh, that was very much my initial starting point. And in, in many ways, that was that's on my part that's very over deterministic, uh, just like the, maybe the building itself. I think another investors will is an uh, important precedent, and also another important precedent for me was at the time um, I was studying at UC Irvine, so there is this uh, history of new topographics, specifically Lewis Vault, and kind of using photography to scrutinize the built environment. But this project is also kind of like for me about very much responding to what you would actually experience and also learning from it. So in many ways, um, even though there was initial impulse or desire to create a typology, it really became about me learning the limitations of imposing that idea in the sense that because again it comes back to these capsules being lived spaces by different individuals that based on how e the state of each unit and how each person organizes it it, it really dictates uh, how I can navigate that space with, as a photographer with a camera and also this idea of how do you gain access to the building uh, or to the rooms, where with the bishops you had this constant in terms of like you know, say for example, the water towers are going to be shot the specific weather condition in terms of very neutral light mm -hmm. consistently, and yet these are capsules are private residences. So how do I negotiate <coughs> access? You know, when can I get access? Uh, how much time do I have? And depending on the time of the day, the lighting condition is very different too. So it's, all, it's really, even though there is this idea of repetition and surreality, it also becomes, it kind of shows you that photography is so much about, is so much contingent on factors that you can't control. Mm -hmm. But at a certain point, I started to embrace that. No, I think it's very interesting because there's a certain coolness, you know, to the image and not, they're, to my mind, very ambiguous in terms of, you know, whether these would elicit outrage at the kind of destruction of this project or pathos about you know, sadness or would uh, you know, create a movement to preserve. You know, it's, there isn't any one particular interpretation that I, I would be able to draw from them. Uh, and, uh, I think it may be also in the way they were shot. I mean, they're not really you know I mean? overly dramatic or, you know, um, there's a certain... Well, I think, again, the meaning isn't constructed from the very beginning where I, I'm not necessarily interested in dictating how it's read, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of, um, yeah, in terms of the audience. Um, it's, it's, a very com it's, a, it's a very complex space. And it's a very loaded space too, so it, it's in, it would be impossible for me to reduce it to a single message, uh, since there are so many capsules, and so many capsules in different states. But that's also a similar case in terms of like even the residents and how they feel about the building itself, where there are significant number of residents who are in support of the idea of preservation, and there's also a significant number of residents uh, who are in support of uh, rebuild, making the, replacing the building with a conventional apartment complex. And they have very valid reasons too. So it's this complex, complexity and how do you represent it? Or how do you respond to it? I think, I mean, something that's interesting to me about sort of questions of your style and shooting it is, it struck me when I first was looking at these photos that even though we all we all do think of this as such an iconic building, and it was obviously designed sort of to be photographed and to be this powerful image in the city. I think that the interiors seem to be very resistant to photography or very resistant to image making in a certain way. And it occurred to me, I had never seen, I guess with the exception of the ads, I had never really seen the interiors photographed. I had seen the sort of famous diagrams, the sort of axonometric drawings that I felt that they had been designed not really as 
spaces with even a point of view, really, but they had really been designed as these kind of over-determined spatial units, as Jesse was saying. And so I, what's interesting to me is that by somehow overcoming that resistance or finding your way in as a photographer, what really emerges is the subjectivity of the residents rather than mm -hmm. necessarily just the quality of the architecture itself. Yeah, they were more machine-like yeah. descriptions. Yeah. Like yeah. Isometric. Yeah. yeah, all very objective architectural yeah. representations, yeah. Um, I think over time to this project, um, it initially started out as um, my interest was in the build, uh, in kind of like Kurokawa's history with the building. The fact that this building is significant because Kurokawa made it, and that you know is this embodiment of this idea of metabolism from a specific moment in post-war Japan. But over time to uh, this was a long-term project, so it was a lot of repeated visits and being patient in terms of building networks and gaining access. And it, you know, these photographs are only possible through those human-human interactions. And for me, it really did, did be, it then gradually become became about the residents themselves and how each of these spaces are occupied. Um, so I think ultimately that's where my interest lies. And um, Another thing that kind of came up to kind of like building on this idea of residence is that I was talking with um, Tiffany Lambert in terms of like this idea of residents who occupy the space. And so much of metabolism was this idea of like uh, this flow or interchangeability in terms of um, the exterior or the capsules. How, how, how does that movement appear from the exterior? And yeah, I realized that there's so much movement happening inside the building in terms of constant cha change over resident. And for me, that became really fascinating in terms of like the resident and how each resident starts to modify that space too. I think that's a nice point that in that sense, it's not a failure at all once you add the residents into the equation. Um, but we should probably open it up to audience questions now uh, before we go on too much longer. Anyway. Yeah, I have a follow-up actually from what you were saying yeah. before and about how can we learn from, from this building. No? Because somehow this building comes from a moment in which the fascination about uh, like nomadism no? or, or that image of, of that like cosmopolitan person that is like talking to the other side of the world, is like sitting down in this capsule and he's gonna be traveling to another place like in two weeks, no? and somebody else will replace him. So like, the replacement of the cells of the capsules is also a replacement of circulation of the people, right? That is living in these in these buildings. So for me, what is interesting to, to think about is what uh, it was. A, it was like a moment in which that was a fascination and almost like a utopian moment, and, and it served that way, right? That building had an image that was like looking to what might happen in the future. But now we are exactly at that moment, right? Like we are in um, in a situation when, with in which that circulation, it's not anymore a utopian circulation, it's not that fascination, that positive fascination of how amazing it's to travel and how and how good everybody travels. No, it, it's a much more pessimistic situation in which not everybody travels the same way, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I wonder, and, and also like in, in connection to examples that we're seeing here in New York, in which like micro units are like being uh, presented and, and sold as a possibility, you know, to to the uh, like the pressures of the real estate market, you know. So so the so the whole process is not so so positive, uh, so so positive, right? It's like a little bit more complicated. So I wonder how can these towers can help us to think about what is the role of the architect looking at these issues, you know, and how the fact that this tower is being contested and, and possibly um, uh, like, um, demolished, you no. Know? That's also like a symptom of, of certain issues that are happening also in the, in the city. So I wonder how can how can we architects can be looking at these issues and how what is the, the, the example that this tower is, is giving us in, in, in that sense? I don't know, it's, a, it's very hard to answer that, especially in the context of Japan, because it wouldn't even be about, I don't know, about the cosmopolitan people in general, but that there would be kind of a cultural dimension in Japan that might shift this to, if, it's, if, if the building becomes uh, treated as a national treasure for whatever reason, then there will be people and uh, you know, groups that will actually um, 
treat it like Issei Shrine. <laughs> and we'll you know, use the 20 year pattern instead of the 25 year pattern, whatever, and they will clean it up and they will also, you know, the, the, those interiors will become visible for the first time. Uh, these almost pass below vision, I would say. There's a certain invisibility that only becomes visible when the photograph fixes them, but it's more like something that, you know, most of Japan is actually like that. Like the exteriors like that too. And then there are selected areas for, you know, that are revered and are kind of elevated to cultural uh, significance. Uh, which I think is somewhat different, say, from here. I don't think there's a that degree. I mean, it's kind of culturally linked. And people will follow the rules, and they'll work in groups, and, and will maintain that building when the cue is given. You know, just in the same way they'll polish the leaves on the trees in Kyoto Park. So we'll have all these elderly people up on, and they'll do it. Well, I so have. group <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's a strange... Normally, the particular thing. for Japanese, the yeah. real estate, the, the land is so valuable, they will destroy these buildings in a minute. But the Kurokawa folk in the court say that the, this was um, a labeled as a national, no, no, as a world her heritage. He, it wasn't like that, but he lied. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he lied, and then in a way, and then the main problem was that I said that the, um, the, the asbestos was the main issue, so Turoka was trying to convince uh, everybody in the government, say that you just have to replace the part, create a new part, right. and then you can't destroy this because this is the world heritage. Right. So it became like a mushmash, and then issue disappeared, and so this building is still standing. So every time I pass by, it's oh, still there. <laughs> yeah, any more questions? I'm curious about the decision not to include the inhabitants in the rooms, because it seems it makes, that alone almost makes it more of an archeology span of a monument than sort of a portrait or a documentary of a living building. Yeah, I think for me, it kind of comes back again to how to approach the space in the sense that um, there is a traditional idea of portraiture uh, or portraits in, in the sense that to represent a person's likeness. But I was kind of interested specifically in the spatial nature of these capsules in the sense that they function, they, they are like containers, but they also function as containers in terms of the things that people decide to bring into that space, the, pe the things that people buy for that space and how to organize that space too. So how could these capsules be act as like say frameworks or frames in terms of a, a capsule as an extension of that person? So without sh literally showing likeness of that person, I was interested in how to point to that person's identity. In the sense again, it becomes this like uh, play or there's play between similarity in the sense that all the capsule, they're all images of capsules, but through that uh, repetition of similarity, how to accentuate the differences, meaning that individuality or the individual that occupies each of these capsules. What if you found if any of the residents sort of resembled their capsules in the way they had been decorated? Well, certainly. I mean, I mean, we can kind of like like analyze this particular image too, where who exactly occupies this space? Too? I mean, so neatly organized, right? In terms of like maximum efficiency, where a pool, a clothing rack is uh, created right above the bed. You know, everything is neatly organized. This is used as a full-time residence. Uh, a washing machine, of all things, in, is in the back. Um, and then you know you have a capsule like this. Uh, where you know, it's also a container, and yet it, it, it and it's used as a full-time residence too. But the sensibility is very different, and also the state's been very different too. More questions? Maybe just a comment on yeah. the idea that as architects, as architects, we don't get to get our building photographed 40, 40 years after we've made it. 
Um, and I think that, that in that, there is in a lot of what is in what you guys are talking about, you know, from the failure of technology to the um, inhabitation and transformation. Uh, I'm really curious on if you guys could reflect on that idea. One thing I, you know, I guess it's in a way more of a question for Nori Taka, but for me, I mean, part of what comes out, I really liked Jesse's point about a, maybe a loose, a loose fit being important. I mean, because the failure of technology specifically was so striking to me, or not even failure, but just sort of the, the inevitable obsolescence over a time frame like that. And it, you know, I, it, I mean, there's, I think there's one where you see an iPhone being charged like on the station by the 8-track and it's just this kind of amazing juxtaposition. Um, so I guess for me, it, you know, in some ways what was interesting, um, almost in the dumbest way to see, well, obviously there are still beds in every unit, right? But but the, the details of technology has changed. There's still, the, many of the bathrooms are original because you still need a, a toilet, for example. So to try and think about um, if anything, and I guess this answers, as it speaks to Carlos's question a little bit too, that if anything, it's a, maybe a lesson about um, what scale an architect is sort of best equipped to intervene in that? Is that, I don't know. Yeah, but I, I really don't believe it. I you know, mean, there's okay. something that I really find uh, profoundly wrong in this assumption because I do think that, actually for me, what is super interesting is the fact that the, the building, when you photograph a unit that is original, is exactly an idea of 1972. The title of your book is amazing in that sense, right? But when you photograph an image of right now, it's an image of right now, right? One can look at the iPhone, one can look at the kind of computer and so on and so forth, the, the chair, the stupid desk chair, right? Even through the mundane objects, you can understand the time. And I think that that is so inerit, inerrant to our life, to architecture, to, to the, the things that enter our worlds that um, I don't know if that should be read. I mean, I, I'm more interested in the idea of reading the, uh, the positive uh, strength of wanting to in, mm -hmm. embed your present 300% rather than feeling like, oh, we can't do it because at some point you become obsolete. When I said technology, I also thought of asbestos, right? That's a technology too. And that's inherent, inherent in anything we build right now. And one more comment I wanted to make is also to what you were saying uh, before, um, as far as the unit, the architecture receding in a way, because what I find instead in the photograph is that this window, it's always there, yeah. you know, yeah. despite everything, through the curtain, through the mess, through the hanging, um, um, clothes on the, the, the hanger, uh, the same ship on top of the frame, that window is there. So somehow for me, independent of whether the TV is there, whether it, it works, whether the, the outfitting of the furniture is still relevant or still functional or it has been transformed after 40 years, but the architecture yeah. is still very present. Yeah. I think that's a fair point. Right. More questions? Huh? Should we wrap up? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So this is a, we can keep the conversation with the wine and with the book. So please, like, well, big applause for the <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.